Okay. So, morning. Um, there was a new member that was looking at joining, and uh, he didn't. John, his name is John. He didn't sign in this morning, eh? No, I guess not. Um, <laughs> did Dave, you in touch with him? Dave, I addressed that earlier. I've been in contact with him several times. Okay. It's been handled. Yeah. So, so he's going to sit in on the meeting on Tuesday? Possibly, yes. He's yeah, busy okay. today. Okay. No, very good. So, so this is what we're going to tie today. It's, it's a, a longer bunny leech uh, with a, a stinger hook in the back and the front hook has had the hook part cut off. I did it two ways. One where I used a single piece of, of bunny strip, started at the back and worked it forward and then onto the front, wrapped around the front. And I find it a little, a little stiff in the middle. So I decided I would do one a little differently where the two hooks are completely separate. Uh, I've got a, uh, I tie a little piece of fur on the back hook and then tie the monofilament in and then tie a fur on the front hook and, and do the wrap on the front hook. And this one has a little more flexibility, so we'll, we'll do that one. The, uh, the back hook is, is, is this guy here. It's a check nymph hook, but you could use a, uh, basically one of these guys. It's, uh, Basic hook. And then the front hook, I just, what I had in inventory, I picked one that has a reasonable shank. Uh, it says it's a stinger hook, but it's just got a reasonable shank length. And I'm, I'm using a size six just for the excuse, gas. Excuse me, Dave. Excuse me yep. for interrupting. Could I ask the, the guys to mute their, their, uh, their, we keep jumping to other people. Yeah. Please, thank you. And then, the bunny itself is rabbit strip. There's, there's tan. This is the one I'll use today. It's an olive. Actually, that's a not a tan. The one I'm going to use is 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 an olive strip. Um, to tie the front hook to the back hook, I've got in here a piece of 15 pound mono. I tried it with the Maxima, which I found a little on the stiff side. So I'm going to use the mono today and we'll see how that works. Um, it's in one of these packages, this one here. Um, so the first thing we'll do is we'll attach the thread to the back hook, right behind the eye. And my thread is jammed here, so I'm going to have to undo that and unjam the thread. There we go. Right. So I'm just going to wrap the thread back to what's wiggling here. That's better. I'm going to go right back to the uh, as where the hook starts to bend pretty good. Trim that off. And then I'm going to take my bunny strip and we take the end where the, you see how the nap on the bunny strip goes one way and not the other. So I'm going to take the end where the nap falls off the back end. And I'm going to put this guy on here so that there's just enough leather overlap that it goes a little past the bend of the of that hook. And I'm gonna tie it down where the thread is. And I'm gonna take my bodkin and just sneak in here and lift up all of the, the thread to create that bare spot where the leather is. And I'm gonna set that over the thread and do a couple of good wraps 
And this keeps me from tying the fur down too much at the back. And then you can see that's nice and clean. I'm gonna bring my thread forward. And before I tie it off, I'm going to do the next little piece, which is to take my little bit of monofilament So this stuff's going to be hard to see. It's clear. Um, and I'm going to put it through the eye of the hook. And I tried using a standard uh, clinch knot or trialing knot. And that didn't work so well. So I'm going to do what's called a uni knot, which you put it through and double, double the, the the nylon back making a little loop with the doubled and then I put the tag end through that loop three times if I can get my fingers to work one two come on I gotta be able to see what I'm doing here I can I can usually do this without a problem, but today my fingers are not working. I found the trialing knot surprisingly, the clinch knot surprisingly, as I did the improved clinch, pulled out with the maxima. So now the an, a uni knot is basically a slip loop. I don't want to cinch it down too tight. I'm just going to stick my bodkin in that loop before I cinch it down ah, with it. So now that I get that loop done, and I'm just going to take my fingers here and tighten this down pretty good. There we go. Trim off the tag. Now I'm going to take my strip and measure right behind the eye. Pull the, uh, the fur back again to bear the, the leather. Wrap my thread over top a couple of three times. This is just to put some fuzz on the trailer hook. A couple of wraps in front. And then I'm going to whip finish. That didn't work too well. Uh, Should have left that till later. <laughs> what I want to do though, I, first off, I want to, when I get that fur tied down, I'm going to trim it off. There we go. So this was all in aid of trying to create a, a little bit of fur on the back hook and let the mono do the business of loosening up. To heck with this, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to redo that knot because I can't whip finish without, with the mono in the way. So we make mistakes. There we go. Now I can whip finish. Doesn't have to be too pretty because it's going to be buried in the middle of the fly anyway. So all I've done here is I've, I've given that back hook a bit of a dressing. Let's see if I can do it. 
uni knot again, or what they call a Duncan loop without screwing up my fingers here. Make sure I got a, a piece of model for that. Make it a little easier. Again, making making that loop, passing the tag through. And I actually have a way of tying this knot uh, by passing the fly through the loop, not the tippet, not the not the tag end. One of these days I'll demonstrate it to you guys and and because doing this in the wind is not easy. And I found I could do it by feel if I did the other way. The topology of the knot is the same. I'd do it the other way, but it doesn't, uh, makes it a lot easier to tie. So there I have this little loop and I just cinch it down. And the reason I tied that rather than I clinch is this has a, a fair bit of wiggle. You can see it. Wiggles front to back. Now, I'll put that out of the way. That's the back end of the fly. And then I'm going to get my next hook, the, the, the sacrificial hook, for want of a better term, because we're going to cut it off at the bend. Put that in the way. And same thing, we're going to start the thread at the front. Wrap the thread all the way to the back. Now, the next thing is to attach the trailer hook to the front. And to do that, I'm going to put, take my mono and I, I'm going to thread it through the eye of the front hook. And then I'm going to bring my you see my thread, my tying thread is at the back of the front hook. Now I'm gonna put this back and forth here. You can see, you can determine how long you want this thing to be by how much you're gonna let the thread hang out the back of the front hook. And I'm gonna leave a little less than half an inch from where the thread is there. And then I'm gonna wrap my thread over top And I'm going to do this up to the front. Dave, was the monofilament 15 pounds? Yep. And when I get, when I get within about a eighth of an inch of the eye, I'm going to take the mono and I'm going to, I've threaded it through the eye here. And I'm going to pull it underneath and then wrap over top of the doubled up mono. You could probably use 10 pound for the size of fish we catch around here. And then I cut off the tag end of the mono. Now the purpose of, of doubling, putting the thread through the eye and doubling it back underneath is that will never pull out now. So you'll never separate that trailing hook from the front hook. You just have to make sure that the mono you choose is small enough it doesn't block the eye of the front hook. And I get my thread to the back again and then we repeat the procedure with the bunny. Um, 
And so I'm going to now measure my bunny leech so that it comes back and it overlaps the back of the hook, the back hook. So you see the leather is just going to reach to where the eye of the back hook is. And at that point, I'm not, not going to take my bodkin and where the thread is hanging down from the front hook, I'm going to snick my bodkin in up against the, the leather there. And I'm going to separate it so that I've got now I'm trying to make a a bear patch on the on the leather again. I'm going to form uh, Terry. You can see now that the leather's got a bear patch and it hangs over the tail hangs over the back. And then once again, a couple or three wraps. Making sure everything is the heck out of the way here. When I get it in the right spot, I want it sitting on top. I'm going to do a couple of wraps right in front and then bring my thread forward. And I'm going to leave it shy of the eye of the hook by hmm, three sixteenths of an inch, a little more than a, a little more than an eighth of an inch. And at this point, I'm going to take my bunny fur. And I'm going to start wrapping it around the front hook. And I always, when I wrap this now, I'm going to stroke the fur back to the back as I wrap the leather forward. And I want to make sure that that fur is all going to the back. When I get to where my thread is, I start on the stop on the top and I pull the, the loose fur away again. And I'm going to wrap my thread over. And you'll see the reason that I stopped a fair bit back from the eye of the hook is I don't want to uh, crowd it too much. Now, when I do this wrap in front to lock it in, now I can trim it off. And then I'm going to stroke all this stuff back and I'm going to bind that leather part of the fur down really good. Now you see I've got a, an extended body with two parts, part on the front and the part on the back. And then this is just adding gild to the lily, or as they say, gilding the lily. I'm going to bear the stem on this orange hackle. I'm going to set it down here and tie it in. <coughs> A couple of wraps to wrap it in front so it won't pull out when I start wrapping. Hackle. <coughs> Hackle pliers. And once again, I'm going to, as I wrap the hackle, I'm going to try to stroke it back to the back a bit. So it's kind of out of the way of the tying thread. I get three wraps, maybe four, nice and bulky. And then tie the hackle off. And then one more. And then wrap in front. Carefully get in here and trim the hackle. Hackle not to thread. And then I'm going to bind this down and build a little bit of a thread head on the front. And the whole purpose of that thread head is making a little cone here to try and force that orange hackle 
backwards a little bit out of the way. And then we will finish. I need more light. Cut thread off. And we're almost done. So now you can see I've got this little bit of a hanging, hanging uh, tail that's got material on it. But when it all goes through the water, it's going to form one piece. But now I got to get rid of this guy so I don't have a double hook in the way, which would cause an awful lot of foul hooking on the fish. So I'm going to expose the bend. Serious wire cutters. I'm going to get here and just back where the hook bends, I'm going to cut it. And put that away. So now I have a non-hook hook on the front and a hook on the back. And to make things nice, I'm going to take my little popsicle stick again. And I'm going to fuzz this all out. And there you go, an extended leech. And because of the, you can see it's going to wiggle a fair bit. There you go. I've seen those with treble hooks on the back. Is that legal in uh, BC? Ah. Uh. I think as so long as they're marvelous. <laughs> no, yeah. I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you for sure. On the ocean, Please. yes, but not on, on the ocean. ocean. Yeah. yeah. I, have right. a, I have a little suggestion for folks. Instead of using a hook, there's a device that they use for steelhead uh, flies. It's yep. called a, a shank, a steelhead shank. Yep. You, can, you can get them in different sizes, and it just consists of, of this. It's just a, uh, a straight piece of metal. And uh, we use those for tying steelhead flies. Yep. They work really well. And the other comment I would make is, is um, when we use, when we put the, uh, the wire on the back hook, on the trailer hook, we just, we just usually put two loops in so that it loops over the, the eye of the hook rather than tying a knot in it. And mm. that gives you the flexibility as well. And then bring the two two pieces up against the, the shank, tie mm -hmm. them off, fold them over and tie them down. Yeah. There's different ways of doing it, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I tend to use braid. Uh, and what I do is I, uh, I actually make a loop. And I use uh, octopus hooks for the trailer. Yeah, and I can interchange them. I can have a big trailing hook, or a different colored trailing hook. Uh, uh, I have a so that the trailing hook is interchangeable. And the the caveat is when you make the loop with the braid, make sure it's the loop is long enough to go around the trailing hook. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and basically, I have so many ostrich hooks from my steelheading days. It makes a good uh, use of them. And for the lead hook, I mean, I have a whole bunch of hooks that I never use for anything else, you know. So that sacrificial hook is another way of getting rid of hooks. I cement, I, I glue the braid. Braid can be very, very slippery. Even uh, putting it through the eye of the hook, uh, I make sure I super glue it to the to the shank of the lead hook. Yeah, I, we use super glue on them too when we after we've tied the uh, 
the mono or the braid or the wire onto the onto the front shank. I've tied them with these, which are actuator. You can actually uh, can you see that? Yeah. And um, for landlocked salmon, um, we've used those. And here's a demonstration. It's a bit wiry, but you can see that uh, it really wiggles around. Mm -hmm. It's Steve, more sophisticated, like Dave uses. <laughs> Dave, I have a question. When you did the front hook and uh, you extended the rabbit strip past the end of the shank, how far yep. back did it go? Uh, I, I extend it back to where it just crosses over the eye of the trailing hook. Thank you. That's if you're doing it in two pieces. And, and the only reason I did them in two pieces, it, it seemed to be a little more flexible. If it's just one long strip of rabbit, the rabbit keeps it from bending as much. Now, if you used really skinny rabbit fur, it probably would be a little better. But the fur that I had was about a quarter inch wide, the leather part. And I know there's some, some stuff you can get that's like an eighth of an inch wide, the little rabbit strip. And that you wouldn't probably have to separate the two. You could just have a nice long strip that would go on both hooks, one single strip. Uh, yesterday I was picked up some of the micro at Robinson's. They have it in a number of different colors. It's about yeah. an eighth of an inch wide micro. Yeah, that would work. You wouldn't, you wouldn't need to, to, to tie them separately. You just tie the strip on the back of the trailing hook and then just bring it all up for, in one piece. So what's the advantage of this fly? It's just a, a bigger, sexier fly to the fish? The intent, I think, is, is to uh, avoid short strikes to some extent by having that trailing hook. Now, I'm not convinced that's, that's necessary. You can um, use a 4X long hook and it'll be just as long, right? Dave, Dave is it comparable to, um, to Dale's uh, bunny leech, that secret bunny leech that he, uh, he's using? Yes, yeah, I think it is. I've got the I've got Dale's information, and I'm going to send a link. I post it on the forum. I'm going to send out a link um, in the newsletter here. Uh, oh, he cool. uses he uses uh, basically tequila co colors. So he's got orange and chartreuse. To me, the advantage of a fly like that is that the um, not having a really long, rigid shank gives you better holding once you hook a fish. In my experience, I I usually don't like long shank hey, at all, um, and just, just having just that for a flexible bit at the end, I find that to be to be helpful. The other way I would I would change this if I were to tinker with the pattern a little bit is if you tie this in big sizes, casting wet bunny is a is a pain. <laughs> and I'm, I'm I'm not a good enough caster for that. Um, so I would avoid the, uh, the wrapped bunny on the front hook and put other fluffy material instead there. Anything like even, a you know, a, a seal dubbing brush, uh, sounds to me like might, might work as a substitute and easier to cast. And then for the front of the fly, I would go and put a bunny collar which is what I use on all my pike flies. And it's, it's pretty good stuff. The other thing is that with, with bunny you can buy um, is either straight cut, yes, the length of the pelt or cross cut. And for wrapping on the shank, cross cut tends to wrap itself much nicer and it's a lot easier it, yeah, it does. To, yeah. to line the fibers, uh, to line the fibers back. So this, this would be my, uh, I, I haven't tied this particular kind of thing, but I, I do use the, the bunny when I do, when I do pike flies, but I go really light on the back and just a little bit of bunny at the front to give that collar, which sticks out very nicely. Okay, so fly number two. 
So if you do that, then you need um, to two different types of rabbit strip. You need the, the regular rabbit strip for the back fly and then a cross cut for the front, right? Yeah, or you could do you could do cross cut for the for the whole thing. I I think yeah. it would it would work as well. Yep. No, here here we on the back one we tied the um the strip straight down the shank so that the cross cut wouldn't work that way, would it? You'd have to do well. A, it would be a little bit on the yeah the fibers would be a little bit on the side. I guess it wouldn't. Yeah. I don't know if it matters much when you fish it, but it certainly wouldn't draw oohs and ahs when you open your fly box. <laughs> and those oohs and ahs are important. No, not for me. I don't give a. Oh, anyway. Come on. You actually let people look at your fly box for it? Only if I've got a few good looking specimens. Of course, I have to. I mean, you know, there's Dennis with his disco creatures every week out there and <laughs> uh, gets the competition going, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> hey, also on the rabbit strip, you said it's uh, barred and I saw just for a second there, the you were using olive, I think, and it's like a dark and light olive. Yep. So. Barred olive. Sorry? It's barred olive. Right, so it's uh, two-toned just in, in olive or two-toned just yeah. in Yeah. So but but you, like, could, you could use plain. You, I mean, the bar just gives it a little more, more variation in the way it looks. Hey, uh, Dave? Yeah. Um, there's something in uh, bass fishing lures, which is called a uh, striker hook, which has a kind of a silicon rubber uh, loop on, on the front of the, huh. of the hook. And you just hook it over your front hook, like on a thing called a buzz bait. Yeah. Um, you hook it over the front hook, but you haven't removed the bend or, or barb on the front hook. Yeah. But it is called a striker hook. Mm -hmm. And it's for short strikes. I don't we know if that, that could be adapted. <laughs> we, we did that with... Uh, fishing for barracuda down in the Caribbean. We, you'd carry a, a great big popper type fly with a pre-snell loop on it. And then you'd, you'd have your regular uh, fly that you would be fishing for bonefish with. And if you saw a barracuda, you'd take that loop and put it over the fly in front and cast it out for the barracuda. Ah. It saved you having to actually change flies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, right, so the next is, is Mr. Hare's here, um, which is a common, common fly that people said was, was working well at Prospect Lake. Um, material, well, the hook is a, just a standard still water hook. The bead is a uh, 1 8 inch gold bead. Um, the ribbing is uh, copper wire. The uh, Brits and the Kiwis call this a hair in copper. Hair as in H-A-R-E. Um, this is hair's ear dubbing of various colors. And I would normally tie them with those two, but I'm gonna show you the traditional and the reason it's called a hair's ear is because there's the bunny mask. If you don't happen to have one of these, you can use the other stuff, but I happen to have a couple of these. And I will be making my own dubbing off of this guy. And if you do that, uh, I don't know if it's visible here. See the difference in color between yes. these two? Yep. They come off the same mask. Yes. And if you pick and choose carefully, it's usually it's darker in the center. And I'll show you how to do that. And, uh, oh, okay, so you'll demonstrate that, yeah. And the trick with the, with the air can to mix it nicely? No, I'm just gonna do it in my hand. Oh, okay. So there's the bead on the hook. Brass bead or tungsten? Yep. <laughs> Um, tan thread, 
tie on behind the bead, dress the hook a little bit first, and fingers are not working today. Clean that up. The next thing I'm going to put on here is some wire. And I'm going to take a piece of wire about three inches long, call it. And I'm going to stick the end of the wire up into the bead and that just helps keep the bead at the front. And when I wrap this, I'm going to put the wire on the far side of the hook from me. I'm going to tie it right back to the bend. Get the wire down and out of the way, the back. Now, bunny mask. It's, the, the fur is different lengths in different places on the mask, and it's different colors. So you can see there's some really dark stuff here and there's some really light stuff here. Um, what I'm going to use for the tail is some of the longer fibers that are kind of on the side. They're a little lighter in color. Or there's some here that have some nice marking at the tips. They're, they're, whoops, what happened there? Did I bugger something up here? You're sure. Somebody's sharing a screen. Yeah. Is Dale Shiel? Dale, if you could uh, undo that. Uh, or I can stop in. Uh, it's it's Graham Scholes that's doing it. Oh, is it? Okay. I can uh, stop him sharing with my account. There you go. So I'm going to pick some stuff that's fairly long with some coloration on it and i'm going to get Sorry my about that, guys i'm going to get my scissors right down up on the mask and i'm going to cut a chunk of stuff off you can see here and you'll see there's there's the uh, the tips i'm going to hold by the tip and i'm going to pull the fluff out from underneath And I'm just going to keep pulling fluff out until all I've got is, is the longer guard hairs. And I'm letting all the fluff sit down on, on the desk in front of me. And that's probably a little too much, so I'm going to thin it down a little bit. Okay, there. So there's the, there's the long guard hairs that make the tail, and there's a little bit of markings at the back. So I'm going to measure that just from the back of the bead to the end of the shank. So it's not a really long tail. I'm going to put that over the thread. And now that that's tied in, I'm going to wrap it up the shank of the hook because I, I will need some bulk. I'm just going to make sure that when I where my tie in point there is back just about as far on the bend as I can get. And that's probably not quite far enough because I want to have that start right where the wire is. Okay. So there's there's my tail, not too not too bulky. Now all this fluff that I pulled out that's going to be the dubbing for the abdomen. I, I've, I've collected a ball of this from tying several of them. And I'm just going to mix it all up in my fingers like this. And then some of the fibers are a little on the long side. So I'm going to take my scissors and, and I'm going to cut in here and just cut it up a little bit. This, you could do this in a blender or a little chopper thing, but I can do it in my hands. And I'm just going to keep 
pulling it and mixing it by hand. Now I'm going to do the dubbing. And, and the, the trick here is don't use much. <laughs> and if you think you've got, in, that's, that's too much. So I just want to keep a very small amount on the thread. Like we said before, when we're dubbing, you can see it's, it's fairly thin material. And I don't use a whole whack of it at a time to keep that thread fairly basically doubled or tripled in diameter is all you want to do with the dubbing. You want to squeeze it on there pretty good so it makes a nice narrow rope. And the reason for that is that allows you to build the profile of the abdomen that you want. So we start building at the back. Keep them fairly thin at the back. And then as we move forward, I'm going to overwrap a little bit to make it a little thicker. Now, if you if you know what, read, read what Dave Hughes has said about mayfly nymphs. There's basically three types. There's burrowers and crawlers and swimmers. And the burrowers typically are not available to the fish, so we don't tie burrowers. But the crawlers and the swimmers, the big difference is in the length and the thickness of the abdomen. And so the, the swimmers are in slower water and they are skinny in the abdomen. The crawlers are on the bottom and they get dislodged and they do a thing called behavioral drift, which is how they distribute themselves along the stream. And they are, they are uh, thicker. So this is actually gonna be a crawler because it's fairly thick. If you're gonna tie a swimmer, you're gonna want one that's a, a hook that's a little longer in the abdomen. So you can tie a really thin body. I'm gonna stop just a little bit ahead of halfway. And then I'm gonna rib this guy with the wire. And I probably only need three good wraps up the body. And then when I get to where the thorax is, I'm gonna wrap that copper wire right up to behind the bead. And all that does is that just adds a little bit of weight at the front, because you want these things to sink. Cover that over. I'm gonna bring my thread right back to where the abdomen ends. Wing case is this stuff, pheasant tail. And I want it dark, so I'm actually gonna use the dark side of this for the wing case. And I'm gonna take these out to the side, figure I need, um, let's see what I got. I'm gonna take probably a quarter inch of this and cut it off the stem. And then I'm gonna tie this in with the dark side down, right where my thread is hanging at the front of the abdomen. And that did not go on there well. Let's try again. Lay it on there and then wrap the thread around. Little adjustment so that it's now sitting on top of the hook, uh, nice and flat. I'm gonna wrap forward to just bind the bead and trim off the butt end of that pheasant tail. Bring my thread back right to where that stuff is tied in, where the abdomen is. 
And now I'm going to make the body. And looking at the bunny face again, you can see there's places where the hair is, is pretty dark. And that's where I'm going to go. And that's right on the ear. <laughs> the ears tend to be the dark part. So that's, this is why it's called a hare's ear, because you're taking stuff off of the hair, the ear of the hair, to make the abdomen. And you see how different that is in color from the other. I'm gonna mix this up in my fingers again. And I'm not gonna, this is all short stuff, so I'm not gonna bother chopping it up. I'm just gonna, it's gonna be a little trickier to get it to stick to the thread, but if I'm careful, when I'm applying it in very small amounts, and a little bit of spit doesn't hurt, I'm going to mix that in. And this I don't need quite as fine a rope because I'm going to have a fairly bulky abdomen, thorax. So I'm going to now put that on the thorax. And you see it gets fairly fuzzy in there. Do one more little bit here. Get fairly dark. So you want this to be fairly buggy looking. And once I've got that done, I'm gonna bring my thread just behind the bead again. And I'm gonna take this pheasant tail over the top and I'm gonna hold it flat with my thumb on top and then wrap around just behind the bead. Make sure that wing case sits properly. Pull these fibers back in front of them to lock them in. And we will trim them on top. And then a couple more wraps and whip finish. Turn that off. The last thing we do is we take again the magic little thingy here and we just rough that stuff up a little bit. Not too much. But you end up with little bits of stuff sticking out underneath. Just one little stray fiber there. Get it there. Got it. There. And that's your hairs here. That's it. If you don't have uh, a, a hare's face, what do you use for the tail? Ah, you use a, a little bit of the uh, the pheasant tail. Okay. You just just use a, a few a few fibers of the pheasant tail, like like that, All right. and just same length. So that's him. Yeah, fish him on a oh sorry. Fish him on a fairly light tippet. And and I, I do like using the uh the Duncan loop or the uni knot to attach these because it's a, a slip loop. And so you don't you, you tighten the knot down without it tightening up against the eye of the fly so that it'll swing around on the loop. Then when the fish hits and, and pulls, that sucks the knot right down to the, the eye of the hook. And I can tie those things almost blindfold now. <laughs> I had I had to learn how to do that. I, <laughs> we were fishing one year. I was fishing with a guy in New Zealand on the Motueka, and uh, it was getting dark. I couldn't see to tie. I had to hold the fly up to the moon to put the tip it through the eye. And then how do I tie that this damn knot? 
So I figured out a way to do that, and I'll demonstrate that one of these days for you. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Say, sorry. The um, if you want to have some more fun with the with the theory of this and uh, various other tricks, um, if you if any of you have uh, Charlie Craven's fly tying book, he's got a he's got a neat trick for mixing dubbing in there, which I have actually tried and it works as described. You basically take, take your dubbing clump and if you want to mix different colors, that's, it's very, uh, very simple and easier than with a, with a grinder. You take mm -hmm. a Ziploc bag and you poke a few holes with a dubbing ne needle to be able to let the air out of the Ziploc bag. And then with a can of compressed air, you put a little tube through the, through the front and then you, you zip it around and you hold it with your fingers. And then you just blow the air and the blowing the air is going to create like a little swirl inside the Ziploc bag. And that's going to mix your fibers very nicely and also keep them fluffed up rather than clumped together. So that's if you if you take a hair's mask and you you process the hair on it all at one time, this is a this is a handy way of um, of doing it. Yeah, there's there's your bunny face. Yeah, that that's that's a hair's mask as opposed to a COVID mask. <laughs> My wife made this. She had she had some nice material that she picked up when we were in New Zealand that has fish on it. <laughs> You've been waiting all morning to use that line, Dave. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so what do you use for liner on that mask? Uh, just material. Just some cotton fabric, whatever. Yeah. Uh, two layers. She's got a layer of cotton on the inside, and then the, this nice decorative stuff on the outside. Stuff, okay. And there's there's basically uh, a heavy duty uh, twist tie that she's sewn in a little pocket on the front, so that you can form it around your nose. Because if you're like me and you wear glasses, if you don't have this part, your glasses fog up all the time. <laughs> Right. So what, what is it that goes in there? Because I, I'd like to make some of these face masks myself. It, it, it's, it's just a heavy duty twist tie. Ah, okay. Yeah. Or a piece of wire if you don't have that. Yeah. Yeah. A piece of bendable wire. Thanks, Dave. That was a couple of good demonstrations. Appreciate that. Good. Not a little case of fumble fingers today, though, for some reason. Well, thanks very much. Probably Dave. the coffee. <laughs> thanks, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. It's a great. Good show. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, Dave, when I went back to Vermont fishing with my brother, we would tie those hare's ears, but we tied them in smaller and smaller and smaller. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> it's a lot of fun trying to catch a fish on a really tiny one, but uh. well, that's that's a size ten. So you, you can imagine when you when you get to fourteens and sixteens, how fine and thin you have to make that dubbing rope in order to keep it from being fatter than a basketball. <laughs> it, it it takes time and patience to do that. Thank you, Dave. Hey right, guys, any Have suggestions week, for uh, next week? Let me know. Tuesday. Dave, it's been a while since I you I tried tying with uh, deer's hair, spinning deer's hair. Oh yeah. And, uh, years ago, I made some little mice for bass fishing on the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you can show the guys how to spin some deer's hair and uh, make oh yeah i can i can do that we can maybe not just a, a pattern per se but just the techniques yeah yeah how, how to 
tie deer hair right smack on top, like uh, doing an elk hair caddis, uh, and then how to how to do what we call stacking deer hair, uh, and then yeah. how to spin. Yeah. Were you talking Great. about a butler minnow? Uh, yeah, we could do that. A muddler minnow would work. That would give you the spinning part uh, for sure. Yeah. Well, the uh, when you're on the hair topic, um, do you guys have traveling sedges, the big ones? Yep. The Mikulak sedge would be a fun one to do. Which? The Mikulak. You could do that one. <laughs> uh, you know how to tie it, right? Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> I think the traveling sedge, I think, is is more of an interior. That's uh, that's where I that's where I fish this this fly, and it works as advertised. Yeah, I'm going to the interior with uh, Sandy and Ron, who have signed off here. I see, but uh, in the beginning of June, so we they were mentioning about sedge or something at, uh, at dusk and dawn, I guess. Yeah, these are the insanely big ones. Yeah, that live in lakes. Mm -hmm. And when these things, like I, I remember fishing this lake in the interior near Kelowna and we got to the lake and the water was like dead and we fished and fished and fished and there were a few loons lazing around and it was like, okay, what's going on here? Um, and at some point this thing started to come off and then it just went crazy for a while, basically you could troll the thing behind your boat with an electric motor and, and fish would just chase it. Uh, it, it. It was surreal. And then the loons got in the act too. I had a fish on and then the loon decided that it wanted the fish. And um, I was pulling on one end, the loon was pulling at the other end. It was, it was weird for a bit. Um, uh, there, there used to be good traveling sedge hatches in Peter Hope and, and Roach. I've, mm -hmm. I've had some fantastic fishing at that time up there. Yeah. So this is like a triple elk hair caddis. Yeah. You, the it's like sedge. You, you're tying three elk hair caddises behind each other on the same hook. Mm -hmm. That's roughly what it is. Yeah. So it's if you can do an elk hair. You do that and I'll, I'll, I'll do a little research and practice on a, on a muddler and uh, we can do that. The traveler's sedge is the equivalent to the stonefly hatch and the black ant hatch. If you yeah. hit it right, you're gonna have the most amazing fishing. And it's midday. Uh, it, the, the, it's a, it's a day, a lot of sedges are nighttime hatches, but the travelers is during the middle of the day and sometimes right in the roughest water. A lot of those uh, interior lakes blow up during the day and, you know, just, you think there's no point in going out uh, that time of the day, but the travelers will be out and the trout will be out. So Dave, do you want me to do then the Mikulak? Yeah, you do the Mikulak and I'll, I'll do a, a mother. Okay. Or a variation thereof. <laughs> okay. Sounds great, guys. Bye-bye. Uh, good. We'll do. Okay, see you next time. See you next. Thanks, guys. Thanks, David. Thanks, guys. Thank you.